this week really represents, uh, I believe, uh, the climax of the story of God. If you're visiting, uh, we've been in a series here since January of 2017, walking through the Bible and seeing it as one story with a common thread. The Bible has 66 books, but those are really a library of books that all speak of a common theme. And so this morning, I want to just start by reading just John 19. If you have your Bibles or it'll be on the screen, you can follow along with us. <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted and said, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. You refuse to speak to me? Said Pilate. Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered and said, You'd have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed you over, handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat down on the judge's seat at the place known as the stone pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. And finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. And the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, with Jesus in the middle. And Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, write this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered and said, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Well, let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's wife and sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said, woman, here's your son now. And to the disciple, he said, 
Here's your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he'd received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Father, as we come to today in this story, we make ourselves pause and slow down and stare at it. We marvel at um, your persistence. that has lasted for centuries and centuries, millennia. The plans and the purposes of God will not be thwarted by man or governments or movements. Here your son died and here we are, 2018. Help us to know why we're on this earth. You know, uh, the last couple years has been an interesting year around our country, right, and around the world. It's, uh, it's been a year or two of turmoil, right? You never know what tomorrow is going to bring. The, the, uh, you're gonna, you'll pick up the news tomorrow, and it's going to be a whole new, a whole new set of uh, protests or upheaval, demands, injustice, Somebody that's been wronged and someone trying to make the wrong right. And uh, I'm not saying it's bad. I, I think it's a, it's a part of our process, right? But um, I was reflecting on, on that and this week. And actually, as a pastor, I've been struggling the last few months to wrap my mind around what is God saying in the midst of it all. Anybody else think that way? I think so. We hear just this endless barrage of voices uh, all kind of clamoring for attention. Listen to me. Pay attention to me. There was a million past this Saturday marching for fill in the blank. Um, but you know, the whole thing of the narrative is really important for you and I because I believe everybody believes something. Everybody believes something about your life and about why what happens happens and and why things have happened to you. We, we interpret our lives through the grid work of the narrative that we believe. Let's just pick something. Um, that somebody has offended, and that's not easy to look around today. Let's just pick the Me Too movement. That's a good one. Uh, there have been uh, men who have been in power, primarily, who have used that power to either manipulate or, or abuse or or, or something for their own selfish gain. And so the offenders have offended uh, uh, these, the, the women who were at the brunt of that abuse. And so the offended are now speaking up and bringing it to the light. And, and so now there's this, this incredible amount of turmoil, like I said, of, of, of who has been offended and who's been doing the offended. And, but most importantly, what are we going to do about it? Think about what I said, that depending on your narrative, you're going to interpret the offender, and you're going to interpret the offense. If I'm doing the offending, um, I'd like to paint myself in as good a light as I possibly can. The last thing I want to be branded as is just this rotten individual. And so as the offender, I want to paint myself in a positive light, hopefully. I'd, I'd rather not get the justice I deserve. As the offended, I have to interpret what is really due me. What, what, is, what, is, what do you owe me now as the offended, right? And depending on the narrative that I see that through, that might take on a different, um, a different uh, end, right? You think about everything that you've encountered in your life that is difficult, I believe fits in there somewhere. 
something has happened to me, I've been offended, the offender should cop, up, cop to it, uh, uh, confess it, admit it, and the offended should get some kind of recompense. In other words, there should be justice, right? The question is justice according to what and who? What does justice look like? I submit to you that the message we're talking about this morning, the passage we just read, is about purely justice. But not the justice of a mob or the justice of a religion or the justice of an ethnic group or a gender. Or, or a tr- it's the justice of Almighty God. Think about that. The justice of Almighty God. Have you ever been to, had to go to court for some reason? Well, you probably shouldn't raise your hand, but I've been in court, right? There's something incredibly humbling about standing before an individual, a judge, who has your life or your checkbook in their hands, right? Anybody ever just go to court because you hope you get your ticket reduced? Your, I went through the red light thing, camera, and it's going to be $340. But if you go to court and you just look pitiful, they'll reduce it to 110 Great, I can find something else to do with that $200, But you don't go in there with some arrogant vibe going on. Hey, you need to reduce my sentence. No, no, I'm telling you, that's going to cost you the whole thing, 320. Pay the fine. Next. (laughs) Isn't it crazy that when I'm on the hot seat, I I don't want justice, right? When when I'm here, I don't want, oh, no, please, reduce my sentence. But when you have offended me, sick them, God, sick them. Make them pay 100%. Don't let them off a dime. <laughs> That's our human nature at work, at least uh, mine, I guess. Um, so we approach the Bible, and we are going to approach the Bible, the Word of God. We are going to approach that Word with this idea that it is the higher authority than me. The word of God speaks, it's timeless, it's endured the ages of of tradition and change and empires, and the word of God is a higher authority, or I'm going to approach the Bible as a book of good advice, and God, I need you to help me get out of this mess I've made, and could you just do it quickly, please? I'm going to, and I I might take or leave what you say to me. It's kind of like he was describing at at the offering, right? God's saying, turn right. Well, maybe, maybe. John Piper puts it like this. If people today are unwilling to have their way of thinking about the world changed, then either we will twist the Bible to fit our preconceptions or we will reject the Bible outright. But the Bible is resolute in insisting that Christ died in the place of sinners so that the justice of God is satisfied and sinners escape punishment. What he's describing there in that quote is this core, this core story of God. Now, I wasn't raised a Christian, and so I'd like to tell you that the last 30 years of walking with Jesus hasn't answered all my questions. Wayne Grudem, who wrote a book on systematic theology, says that understanding the story of God is kind of like having a jigsaw puzzle. And if you've ever, if you've done jigsaw puzzles, what do you usually do? You have a picture. The box is here, but I don't know about you, but I usually start with the border, right? Because that's the sure thing. The border has all the flat edges. In fact, don't we start with the what? The four corners. We get the corners because that has two round edges. That's like a head start. So I get the four corners, and then I begin to attach the things that go with those four corners, and pretty soon I have a border, and then I work my way in to the inside until a picture begins to develop. Now, sometimes um, the picture is clear and other times it's missing a few pieces and I can't quite understand what it's supposed to be. I think that's sometimes how the Christian faith is. God has set the border, but sometimes the pieces don't quite go together in the time that I'd like them to go or in the fashion that I'd like them to go. And I have to work at it to understand it. Anybody ever feel like your life is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle? Like, I kind of get what I'm supposed to be doing, but I'm not exactly sure. I'm recently married and I'm still trying to figure this out. We had a couple here in the last service. We brought them up. They've been married 65 years. It's funny when you talk to them, in some things in their life, they're just seamless. They think alike and everything. In other areas, they're like, no, no, that's not what I think. I think this. Well, he thinks that, right? 
So it's never going to be this side of heaven. I don't think it's ever going to be crystal clear perfect. Our culture, however, now is like 50 people that have all bought their jigsaw puzzles down to Goodwill and dumped all the pieces in a giant bin. And then we go in and pick out 80 pieces and say, I'm going to go home and make a puzzle out of this. Good luck with that. Because what it produces is confusion and despair. Somehow God has the border set. The border is set. And the puzzle is there. But sometimes it's the, the, the pieces just don't go together as quick as we'd like. So uh, what, is it, what, do, what do I mean? So the, the puzzle begins with this fall. We've all heard this story. We've been around, right? Begins with this fall. It says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden. What did he put him there for? He gave him a great com- a, a commission. It was a great commission, a mandate. He says, work it and take care of it. He, he made man, in a sense, Lord, small l, over the garden. That's what he did. He gave man. Uh, the writer of Psalms would say, what is man that you're mindful of him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. God says, I crowned you, man and woman, created in my image with glory and honor. When Adam was made, he shared glory and honor with God. He had honor because of uh, who had created him. That was the reflection of God. That's what honor is based on. Honor is based on our worth, our value. Listen, please do not raise your children with a standard of honor based on performance. There's times where we honor people for performance, but people are worthy of honor because we're created in the image of God Almighty. Male and female, he made them. So in this place of glory and honor, of course, God commands the man, you're free. I love that that goes first. You are free to eat anything you'd like. It's all yours. It's all there before you. Except, except, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there's the warning. So we have this mandate. We have this promise. We have this warning. And now we have a consequence. When you eat it, you are going to die. You're going to die. And so the Bible calls that word, that action, that, that choice, the Bible calls it sin, S-I-N. That's not a popular word today. Uh, we've substituted all kinds of other words for that. Uh, I slipped, uh, I inadvertently, I, um, I had a moral uh, kind of a f- little flare up. I mean, you know what I'm talking about? We use words. I mean, when's the last time you heard a politician say, You know, that thing, that was a sin. (laughs) No one does that. It's not a popular word anymore, but it was around the 1960s, 1965 or 6. Psychologists coined a term that has become actually quite popular and quite common today. I want to read you just all kind of a Wikipedia definition of the term. It's called uh, narcissism. Narcissism is a personality disorder in which there is a long-term pattern of abnormal behavior characterized by exaggerated feelings of self-importance, an excessive need for admiration, and a lack of understanding of others' feelings. People affected by it often spend a lot of time thinking about achieving power, success, or about their appearance. They might even buy a selfie stick. They, sorry, they often take advantage of the people around them while at the same time being hypersensitive and defensive to criticism or correction. I think what they've nailed here is the human condition because I see myself in that definition. I think we see ourselves. It's not hard to imagine, right? And so there's this condition that has come into our world as a result of Adam's choice. And, And so... It dominoes down through the ages, man to man, woman to woman, generation to generation. M. Scott Peck, a theologian and writer, said, since narcissists deep down feel themselves to be faultless, it is inevitable that when they are in conflict with their world, they will invariably perceive the conflict as the world's fault. 
That's called, what he described in that video, that's called blindness. It's called spiritual blindness. I lack the ability, you and I in a fallen state, we lack the ability to see ourselves as God sees us. That should give us pause. It should cause us some concern. Someone said, I think it was D.L. Moody, said, you will never convince a man or a woman they need to be saved until they're first convinced that they're lost. I have found that in my career to be absolutely true. When a man or a woman feels like there is nothing wrong, the message of salvation and the message of the cross really holds very little value. It would be like selling mm, tickets on the lifeboat on the day that the Titanic sailed from Europe that day. Everybody wasn't interested in lifeboats and lifesavers. They were interested in champagne and caviar and fine music. It wasn't until it got halfway across the Atlantic and a new reality was encountered in the form of an iceberg and it began to sink that you could have given away the caviar, given away the music, and no one would want it, but they would have paid with their lives for a spot on the lifeboat. What had changed? They were on the same ship. They were the same people. It was the same time frame, only the reality. Only the reality had changed. And so the wages of sin, Romans says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You know, there's a perspective thing here that Paul would go on to describe the ripple effect in Romans. For although they knew God at one time, he's referring to the ancients, there was a group of people at one time that knew God they neither glorified God. Remember what we said about Adam? That was treason, what happened. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just disobedience, it was treason. He refused to glorify God as God, took things into his own hands, and neither did they give thanks to God. So this, this thing of gratefulness. You know, if you want to, if you ever had the... Um, the check engine light come on on your dashboard, doesn't it just immediately, you've just taken off for the road trip, you're going to the coast for the weekend, you get 40 miles out of town, check engine light comes on and everything just seems to get the tension and the car goes up. And you better check the engine, right? It's there for a reason. You know what ungratefulness in my heart should be this flashing red check engine light? Eh, 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 right? Because something is overheated in my life. And all of a sudden, I've become the victim. And all you people just are just wrong and aggravating and, and everybody has hurt me and so forth. And what I've become is a little Adam who rather than being God conscious, I've become self-conscious. Self-conscious. That's what he's describing in Romans. They'd lost their God consciousness and now they become self-conscious. And now they claim to be wise but they become fools because their hearts have become darkened. And after that, they exchange the glory of the immortal God, the glory, there's that word again, for images made to look like mortal human beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. They begin to worship creation rather than the creator. And then God just lets them go. And he gives them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. And if you read the passage, it just goes on and on from bad to worse. There's this downhill slide of the result, the consequence of death. That's the bad news. That's the, that's the tough news. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like it's simple, but it's not, it's not simplistic. It's like, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with us is not that we're bad people. See, that's, I think, the rub is our culture today would tell us, you know, we agree that you've missed the mark a little bit and that you're bad in this area. You're a, you're a little overweight and you're kind of angry. So, um, or, you know, we could clean you up here. And they point out three or four things. You know, your, your marriage could use a, let's call it a tune-up, right? And, and so on and so forth. You're kind of cheap and stingy, so we're going to help you loosen that up a little bit, right? And so what they're doing, what, what, what a, what a well-meaning world is trying to do is improve me, improve you. And so they'll put you in the gym. Uh, they'll get you a life coach, a health coach, a finance coach, a therapist. And that team of people is going to bring you back online. We're going to, come on, we're going to put you together the way you were intended to be, right? 
But that is not our problem. <laughs> I mean, it is. It can be a problem that you're stingy or overweight, but um, that's not the issue. The issue is that we're dead. The issue is that we're dead. We're not bad. Listen, there's a big difference between dead and bad. Because if I'm just bad, then if I get my team, my coaches, they're going to make me better. And that is irrelevant. That's irrelevant. I may wear it around my neck and put it on the front of my Bible or put a bumper sticker on my bumper to make sure everybody knows that I'm not a total heathen. But that becomes irrelevant. You see, if I'm just a bad person, then I'll find a way and I'd like to ask God to bless my plans and bless my coaches, but I'm going to make this better because I screwed it up and I'm responsible. And so there's this weird kind of a, a twisted, if I could use the word perversion in there, and I don't mean that in a, in a sexual sense, I mean it in the, its original meaning. Perversion means to twist something that used to be straight, something that was true and, and now it's no longer exactly true. And that's what I see as I see in our culture, people have taken God and they've, he, they've made him one of their, 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 hey, Jesus is my life coach. I'm waiting for that t-shirt to appear. Jesus is my life coach. And Jesus didn't die to be my life coach. He died to bring me and you back from the dead. He's a resurrected savior. And listen, you guys, it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, Without overstating, it's a difference between life and death. Jesus said in the last days, many would come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful things in your name? And he said, I never knew you. I never knew you, really. I never really knew you. Um, I want to finish. The cure is found in Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I like to reserve the term ungodly for, like, I don't know, African dictators who oppress people. But ungodly is just this idea of having a form of the cross, but without any power. That's what Paul would say to Timothy. He said, in the last days, there would be those come who have a form of godliness, but they have no power. The message of the cross is a power has come into our lives that has overwhelmed and conquered the power of sin and death. Does it make us perfect? No, it makes us a people. It doesn't make us perfect. It makes us a people in relationship. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly die. You can almost hear Paul's tone, a voice. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He would tell the church in Corinth, since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all have died, so in Christ, all will be made alive. An old aunt, saint back in the beginning, the first few centuries said, the glory of God is a man who's fully alive now. It's crazy how people have twisted the message of the cross and made it a message of, of death for us. Like, oh, if I, be, if I become a follower of Jesus, I have to die to all my, my, all my fun, all my desires, all my plans. And then we've got it just 180 degrees off. When you come to your creator, life is restored and everything begins to come alive again. And you begin to recognize, man, what I thought was life, oh, that was death to me now. Your conscience comes alive. Your emotions come alive. I believe everything. It's like this spring that happens throughout your life. Of course, the last, maybe the toughest part is this thing that the Bible calls a stumbling block. The reason it's a stumbling block is because it's almost too good to be true. It's too good to believe. It seems too simple. It seems kind of outdated, right? 
you hear people talk about this all the time. Well, you know, the Bible is just, it's just kind of outdated. It doesn't really deal with the tough questions of today. Yeah, I'd love to have that conversation more in depth, perhaps. But you're going to find that if you go around to the conflicts you see that has made our lives complicated, you're going to find the most complicated marriage situation that you have right now. I promise you this, or, or, I'm, or I'll quit, I'm done. You win. Pick the most complicated situation that is troubling your life, and then just sit still and just bring it down, bring it down, simplify it, bring it down to its core, and what you're going to find are two human beings who have some measure of selfishness going on, some unwillingness to, re, to, to, to die, some unwillingness to serve, to admit guilt or whatever, to forgive. And that has blossomed into a host of other issues. And the issues are real. But at its core, is a man or a woman out of sync with their creator, disconnected from wisdom, power, and life. I became a Christian at 23 years of age, not having much, much background in church or the faith. When I became a believer, all around me in my life where I was growing up were quite a bit of issues of addictions and drugs and alcohol, things like that. That was kind of my world. And the thing that validated the gospel to me was, first of all, the message that I'm sharing here, but also the evidence in the lives of people whose lives were transformed. Something had shifted that was unexplainable. For those of you that have come from that kind of a background, you know what I'm talking about. You go back and talk to people who knew you in that other life and you try to explain it and you might as well be talking to your cocker spaniel because it doesn't, make, it doesn't register. They can watch it, there's evidence, but they're like, I don't get it. Now, tell me what else was there. Actually, it was, it was Jesus. Well, yeah, but what did you do? I don't remember actually doing anything. I just, I kind of surrendered and I don't know, I can't explain what that looked like. Yeah, but... In the message of the cross, listen, Paul says... We preach this phrase. You're going to find it seven or eight times just in the book of Corinthians. We preach Christ crucified. Two words, Christ crucified. Christ crucified. Paul would go back over this and back over this in this early church, this troubled church, this church full of issues, full of conflict. This church was a mess. This wasn't the perfect church. This was a mess. Paul says, you know what? We preach Christ crucified. Because he's a stumbling block to the Jews. The Jews were steeped in miracles. They were steeped in stories. The res, you know, taking out of Egypt, manna falling down from heaven, God showing up and bringing victory to our armies. And so the Jews are waiting for this Messiah who's going to just do the miracles to put them back on top. Come on, come on. And all of a sudden, he's being led away to be crucified. No. And the Greeks... Foolishness, because the Greeks were the keepers of wisdom, the keepers of all the answers of the universe, philosophy, Socrates, and Plato, and others. And so to the Greeks, it was like, come on, answer the deep questions of life. And he went right by, and they didn't recognize him. And Paul said, but to both Jews and Greeks, to those who would believe Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I don't expect any news channel anytime soon to come on and come out as agreeing with that. Don't you wait for it either. But man, you know what you have is this subversive kingdom, a group of people who have latched on to this and said, you know, at the core of my being, at the core of my marriage, at the core of my, all my stuff, I found that, yeah, Jesus, he changes everything. It doesn't happen overnight, but he answers the deepest questions of the offense and the offender, the offended, and justice. We're going to finish. Um, the worship team can come and uh, communion here on either side is something we do every week. If you're visiting, you're a believer, it's an open communion. We do this because it's the rhythm of our lives, the rhythm of our community, like Brett was describing, giving. There's a purpose behind every rhythm. It keeps us healthy and it keeps us aware and so that element there is this cup and this bread and what it represents is this power that I'm describing here this morning. This power that came into me from the outside. This power that in the eyes of the world is just, is just it's, that's too simple to believe. It's too unbelievable. But for those of us who have tasted it, it's real. 
So as you approach those elements, Christ crucified, Christ crucified, would you uh, take and grab and then come back and then we'll, uh, we'll take together as we're all served. Thank you.